This is Wednesday's Women, hosted by Caitlin and Taylor. We invite you to join us in a candid conversation about the roles of women in political organizing and beyond as we celebrate the centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment. We hope that you find this ed- episode educational, entertaining, and the women we discuss inspiring. If you like what you hear, subscribe and share. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Wednesday's Women. Uh, sorry, the world sucks right now, but we're going to get through it, you know, like we always do. So who are we talking about today? Today we are discussing Sojourner Truth, who was born Isabella Bumfrey, but later changed her name. Because she's a badass, as we're going to talk about all the way through this podcast. She truly was. Arguably, I think she was a bigger badass than Anthony. Oh, yeah. Katie Stanton, who we haven't discussed yet, but we'll discuss later on. Oh, I agree entirely, especially because there's just so many different issues she went up against and faced without any kind of... Like, I mean, I'm sure she's just concerned. Yeah, but she just, she just went at it head on. Um, so I guess we'll just get started with her personal life, not beat around the bush and get right into everything. Um, so for her personal life, Mm -hmm. like Taylor said, she was born Isabella to James and Betsy in 1796, 97. Um, her parents were owned by Colonel Johannes Hardenberg. If Johannes, he was Dutch. Yes. Um, she has a, she never learned to, um, write or read and we're going to get into this but her dutch accent and the way she spoke is like really important to part of her story and as far as the year of her birth goes there is some like discrepancy they didn't keep great record of like yeah this is gonna sound really harsh but they weren't like oh my 54th slave was born December 3rd, 1797. They were like, oh, we got another slave a couple months ago. And a lot so, of like, there is some... About it. Yeah. So there is some discrepancy regarding, like, 1797, 1798, 1796. 1797 was just the most agreed upon year. Yep. And then, so that was in Ulster County, New York. So you guys can have, like, a geographical idea of where she comes from. Uh, As a child, like we said, she only spoke low Dutch and never learned to read or write, which is really outstanding that she was able to accomplish what she did, given her low education that she got. Um, About 1815, she married Thomas, a fellow slave, and bore five children. Um, However, I did notice that In one of the versions of her anti-woman speech that she is so famously known for, it says that she bore 13 children in all. Don't know how reliable that is because I've never seen anything about that anywhere else except for that one version. Yeah, so I, all the records I found never got up to the number 13. There was some like, oh, she had six kids, oh, she had seven kids. And again, it was like, if it didn't survive, birth or if it only lived like two days after birth they weren't keeping record of it and so while the child was still important to her there's no official record again like the winner keeps the record and they didn't see it as important so there is like if you said to me no she had seven kids I'd be like oh okay um 13 seems like a lot to me I guess it's possible I will say, um, Diana is not Thomas's. Diana is an affair. Um, not like in a, well, I guess it is an adulterous affair, but she met a slave on a neighboring farm and fell in love with him. I forget what his name was. I think it was Roger. I thought it was started with a C. I can't remember. Maybe. Or maybe that Um, was the owner's name. I can't remember. I'm not really sure, um, of his name. But she fell in love with him, and the other owner was like, no, you can't love her. Basically because any kids you have are Johannes's property and not my property. So just the idea that, like, you can't love them because I don't get ownership of your children is, like, a terrible take. A terrible take. (laughs) Um, Please don't ever have that take in your life. But 
Thomas was owned by Johannes and was much older than her, was my understanding from everything I read. Yeah. Um, and she, throughout her life, she was sold to four different owners. The first time she was sold was at a young age of nine, which is really crazy to think of. At nine years old today, you're just learning how to, I don't know, do simple math, and she was getting sold, which is crazy. And I also think what's wild to me is the first time she was sold, she was sold with a flock of sheep. And there was discrepancy in the number, but essentially she was sold with a flock of sheep for a hundred dollars. And when we talked about um Anthony, we talked about she made a hundred and ten dollars and it equated to about thirty six hundred dollars in today. So really they sold human life for roughly three thousand dollars. Plus plus cattle, not cattle. Plus cattle. Like that wasn't even like her life was three thousand dollars. It was like, oh, sheep for years a flock of sheep and a human for like three thousand dollars um it's just like so atrocious to me like that was so hard to read and be like that's I guess in my head I always assumed like only the really wealthy had slaves like you had to be incredibly rich for it so to see that like like I'm not saying I would do it but I could afford three thousand dollars yeah exactly I'm not rich (laughs) Well, and think of anything else in life. If you want, I hate to equate it to this, but I don't know how else to do it. If you're somebody who is low income and everybody else that you know has cell phones, even if you can't afford it, you're going to have a cell phone. So it was like, I think having slaves and being a slave owner was also a very societal thing because they wanted to fit in with what society seemed as upper class Mm -hmm. that was just that was so interesting to me to like see like oh for a hundred dollars because it does really blow this idea that like only rich men own slaves out of the water like really everyone did yep um she did eventually walk to freedom in 1826 carrying her infant daughter sophia and she was unable at the time to get her other child peter but she would later go back and sue for his custody. Um, mm-hmm. In 1843, she finally changed her name to Sojourner Truth. Uh, whenever she left, she said she wanted to remove that time from her life being a slave. She wanted to start completely new. And so she decided to become Sojourner because she knew she wanted to testify. And she said that she was called upon by the Lord. And she said, what am I going to call myself? I want to have two names. It seems like everybody has two names. So what's going to be my second name? And she said he picked truth because she was going to spread and testify the truth. Um, And then the last part, oh, go ahead. No, I was just that's so sad to hear because like two names is such like everyone I know has two names like Taylor Boyle, Caitlin Krula, Engelman like there's just so many like to see that as like something to desire is just so sad. Mm -hmm. And then she died in November 26, 1883 um, this was something Taylor and I was actually discussing. So her tombstone re- read she was about 105 years old, but it's more likely she was shy of 90, but we can't be certain, like Taylor said, because we don't know, um, we, they didn't keep very good records. Yeah. So, um, based on the two dates we provided, she was 86 when she died, which is still like record setting for the 1800s like oh, let's be yeah. clear Especially that's so not like <laughs> who did what she did and had to go through what she did yeah that's not something to be like oh you only live to be 86 it's just like she wasn't 105 and it just attests to the poor record keeping that was done at that time um so one of the things she's very notable for um is actually winning several lawsuits which was unheard of for black women at that time um so she did leave in 1826 and walked presumably the underground railroad with her infant daughter but left her other children um name namely peter is the one they discuss here i don't know 
what happened to the other kids. I don't know if they were sold before she left, you know, how that really worked out. Um, in 1828, she returned for Peter and found that he had been sold to Alabama, to a slave owner in Alabama. Um, at this time, they were already working on um, emancipating the slaves in New York. So selling him to Alabama was keeping him in the market, for lack of a better term. Um, just so, like, I'm not going to have a slave, but I'm not going to let him go free either. Petty. Um, yeah, petty. Not good petty. Not like Marietta Bones petty, where she's like, you can't be a state. Like, yeah. disgusting petty. So this was illegal. Um, so she ended up taking Peter's new master to court. Um, she sued for custody of him, and she won. She was awarded custody of her child. He was then deemed a free man and lived with her. Um, obviously, in 1828, he's, you figure, like, somewhere between, like, five and nine years old. So he lives with her for several years, um, up until 1839. And at this time, she had moved into New York City and was working as a house cleaner. So he is working at the docks, unloading stuff, loading stuff. And he gets this offer to work on a whaling ship and takes this offer. So he goes out on the ship in 1839. Um, supposedly, Truth received three letters from him while, sh while he was gone. Um, though it's thought that he sent her five, he never received the letters she sent him. She does claim she sent him letters. Um, I tried to find out, was it dictated to someone? Or, you know, how was it done? I'm not really sure. I'm going to assume that if she was illiterate, her children were also illiterate. Um, so it could have been done, like, little sketches of her day life and sketches of his day life. There are other ways to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, in 1842, the ship returned to port and Peter was not on board. Truth inquired about him and was not told anything. And never heard from Peter again, nor ever learned what had happened to him. So um, it, it's so sad to think that she went through all that trouble, and this is how she loses him. And it's thought, um, it's not necessarily thought that it was a malicious thing that happened. Whaling ships, it was common for men to fall overboard, for men to be hurt on the job. Like, it, it wasn't thought that he was, like, attacked. It's just thought that he went overboard and they said we're not saving him. But or, then, or, or even even keeping record of what happened, you know, like even if they had tried to save him, there's not even record of like how it happened. Yeah, so um that is really tragic and that's a tragedy truth experienced um fairly early on in life to lose her son a second time. Um that was her first lawsuit, suing for the custody of her son. That was not a last lawsuit. Um, while she was in New York, she worked as a housekeeper for several residencies. One was the residency of Elijah Pearson, who actually ended up dying in a kind of myster mysterious death. Um, Truth was never thought to be the suspect of this death. There was a man, Matthew, who had, like, a cult going on, and they were like, oh, this man definitely killed Elijah. Um, but members of his cult, a couple called the Folgers, um, while Matthew was in trial, were like, if we implicate truth, they'll convict truth and they'll let Matthew go. Um, so they really started a spear campaign, kind of. You know, did you hear Truth killed Elijah? She wanted his wealth. She wanted this, which none of it was true. Like, Truth was not set up to get Elijah's wealth. She wasn't, she didn't benefit in any way from his death. Um, and so throughout the trial, they did this. Following the trial, Matthew was acquitted. They didn't have the evidence to convict him. Um, and... Truth ended up taking the Folgers to court and sued them for defamation. 
and once again won on the argument that I'm a housekeeper. If you say that I go into your house and kill you, no one's going to hire me. Um, so she won her second, <laughs> her second lawsuit of her lifetime. Um, and then finally in 1865, um, this is called a streetcar lawsuit. So obviously the North was a little more um, ahead of the times, I guess, with desegregation and things of that nature. So a lot of people know Rosa Parks and the bus boycotts and all of that in the South. In the District of Columbia, authorities enacted legislation that desegregated public transportation within the city in 1865. So that was within Truth's lifetime, um, long before Rosa Parks and the Civil Rights Movement. Um, so you couldn't deny black passengers but instead what white street car conductors would do is they would just ignore black passengers so if you were sitting there waiting for the streetcar they just wouldn't stop for you um which technically they would argue we were at capacity we didn't see them we weren't intentionally stopping them from getting on board um you know, whatever, whatever argument they felt they could get away with. But Truth um, <laughs> felt this to get injustice, which it was. So she would jump aboard any stationary streetcar. So you're stopped at a red light, Truth's jumping on. You're stopped to pick up a white passenger, Truth's getting on. Um, and she would just sit down and get off at her stop. She was very you know, followed all the rules. On one occasion, she did this, and a conductor dislocated Truth's arm, trying to forcibly remove her from the streetcar. And Truth um, filed a lawsuit for, I'm assuming, damages and then medical costs. Um, but it, it didn't really specify. Again, records weren't kept to the best of their capabilities. But this lawsuit ended up costing the conductor his job and later compelled the streetcar company to enforce the desegregation decree. So they could now report conductors who were not following this desegregation decree. Crazy. So she was definitely not afraid um, to get the courts involved. <laughs> Oh, and that and she always was willing to go up against injustices, and I think that's a really good like transition point into looking at her as as an abolitionist. You know, firsthand, like we talked about this a long time ago. Like the best people to advocate are the people that are experienced, like experiencing injustices, because they know firsthand why it is so important. She devoted her life to abolitionist causes, and she regularly toured and spoke, and she worked with George Thompson. Uh, she worked especially hard during the Civil War. She helped recruit black troops to the Union Army, which was a very new thing at the time. Um, she even encouraged her grandson enlist, which he did do. Uh, and then in 1863, she went door to door to collect Thanksgiving food for the first Michigan recruitment or regiment, excuse me, of colored soldiers in Detroit, which I thought was really neat that she was willing to go door to door to ensure that they were being treated and you know, kind of honored in the same sense that all other soldiers were at the time. And I think it's important to note that she continued the activism during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. A lot of people saw this as like a low point for themselves, like, oh, it's being handled. You know, I've passed the ball off. I have to jog to keep up with the play, but I don't have to run full out. Mm -hmm. She saw this as I'm staying ahead of it. I'm not slacking off. I'm not holding back. Like, we're getting ahead of this. Yep. And then after that, in 1864, she was called to Washington, D.C., and she was there to contribute and um, speak at the National Freedmen's Relief Association. And on at least one occasion there, she met with and spoke with President Abraham Lincoln about her beliefs and her experience, which is really neat. And I think it was probably... While we don't know, I would say it was probably very beneficial for him to see somebody like her who had such, I don't want to say charisma, but she had such a story. And some people have to go to school and train and, you know, 
apprentice to be able to come across and touch people's lives the way she was able to, you know? So I think it would have been really neat to be able to engage with her. And I think that probably was very helpful to Abraham Lincoln at the time. Uh, she continued to advocate for change even after the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, in 1870, she tried to secure land grants from the federal government to former enslaved people, a project she pursued for seven years. But they just were not willing to listen. It wasn't seen as a super important issue, despite the fact that it very much was. Um, I will say, I just want to note this with the federal land grant. Um, this does sort of have, get a bad rap to it. Just because the land she wanted to be given to recently freed slaves was land of the West. And so the argument has sort of become like it wasn't America's land to give away. Like, that's not why they didn't give it away. They weren't like, oh, people live there. You can't have it. Like, I don't want you to think I'm defending it. I just, I think there is something that needs to be said for we have never really valued Native Americans' stake here. Yes, absolutely. They, that was their land. And truth, it was a noble cause. They, they needed their own land. They needed to have a place to live. Like, they were, they were all these recently freed slaves with nowhere to go. Um, she knew the struggle that often resulted in you living with someone and being their housekeeper. And so it was a very similar experience to when you were enslaved for them. Um, so I'm not saying, like, oh, boo, truth, bad person. I'm just saying, like, we need to keep in mind these lands she was fighting for. Someone was living there. <laughs> like, and, like, people just didn't see it that way. They were like, oh, no one's living there. And there's hundreds of thousands of people there being like, no, we're living here. And they're like, well, other than you. Ours. And you're just like, no, it's not. So that is something that, like, as I was reading stuff, they kind of are dismissive of, like, oh, she wants these free land grants. Um, but when you look into it, she wanted to give them the land of the West, which was inhabited by people who called it home. <laughs> um, so I just think that's important to no, note. I agree. I think it's very important. And then while in Washington, D.C., she had a meeting with President Ulysses S. Grant in the White House. Again, I'm sure that was a very interesting meeting because she, there's nobody like her. She was just so interesting. And I also think it's really interesting to think that, not to speak poorly of her, but this illiterate former slave was able to know, help people the way she did. Was able to meet with two presidents. I mean, very few people can ever say I was able to meet with two different presidents at two different times during their terms. Like, that is an accomplishment in and of itself. And then on top of being a woman in a time when women weren't respected, being a recently freed slave, being essentially illiterate. Yeah. You know, she spoke with a very heavy Dutch accent because she learned Dutch first and foremost and was much older when she learned English. Like, so it just really speaks to the charisma that she had and the confidence she carried with her. And unfortunately, that's something you can't learn. That's something you have or you don't. And that actually made me remember something I forgot to bring up in her personal life. Speaking of how Dutch was her first and foremost, uh, the first language she learned, and then, because she, she was bilingual, uh, whenever she was first sold at nine years old, she was actually beaten a lot by her first slave owners because they were only English speaking. They knew nothing of the Dutch language, and so they would give her orders, and she would not know what they were saying. Um, so that's why she had to learn to adapt. So it was kind of almost like a survival thing, which is really, you know, really interesting that she was able to take that, what she learned, and then be able to fight for what was right. Yeah. Um, in 1872, she returned to Battle Creek, became active in Grant's presidential re-election campaign, and even tried to vote on election day. 
However, she was turned away at the polling place. And that like is so interesting because we already know because of our last discussion, Anthony did the same thing and was able to get away with it. Essentially, she did get, obviously she didn't get away with it, but like she was able to get farther than she did. Like she was able to cast a vote, even though she was reprimanded for it in a sense, even though she never paid fines and, but she did go to jail. Like she was able to go that far and convince them, no, I'm allowed. And they let her, and then they didn't do the same thing for, um, Sojourner Truth. And I will say, um, we didn't discuss this in the Anthony episode. It wasn't just Anthony. It was Anthony and nine ladies. They all showed up to the polling place together. And essentially, Anthony was the leader in this. And the story, if you look into it, um, is that Anthony was arguing with the election inspectors at the polling location and, you know, the, the election inspector said, no, you can't vote. Women can't vote. And Anthony was arguing, didn't you hear the 14th Amendment to the Constitution has been passed, which um, it was ratified in 1868. So she's saying that this recent passing gave women the right to vote in federal elections. Um, and she went back and forth with the inspectors, apparently for quite some time, until finally the inspectors gave in and registered the women on the spot, escorted them to a ballot, let them fill out a ballot, and then cast a ballot. You can't even do that today. Like, I'm a registered voter, and there's, like, 20 steps. You have to, like, go in. You're like, this is my name. This is my address. They check you off on the list. Then they're like, wait in this line. Then they're like, go to this booth. And then you, like, select your options, and then you verify that it's you. Yeah. Like, he just let her walk in and cast the ballot. And I get the times were different, but. Replies and, were different, and yet it was still the fact that Sojourner Truth was not able to, they didn't even humor her. Yes. They did not let her say, you know, but wait, they said, you are a woman. You are black. You cannot vote. Leave. Yeah. And. I think, you know, there is some discourse if you look into it about, oh, it was Battle Creek, Michigan versus New York, and it was this versus that. I 100% believe, had Sojourner Truth been white, she may have been able to at least get herself to the ballot. May not have been able to get it cast, but, and she may have faced the same fate that um, Anthony faced. She may have you know, gone to jail, been given a small fine, whatever, well, not a small fine, it was thousands of dollars. She yeah. never paid it, but, yeah. <laughs> but I do think it was um, a lot of things acting against her. So I do think it just goes back to that idea that a lot of these suffragettes had a lot of privilege. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. So, and, or not Anthony, <laughs> Truth was not only um, an abolitionist, she was also a prison reformist, which is something we haven't really talked about at this time. She was actually many things. She fought for property rights, for temperance, um, for just so many different movements. We tried to just highlight her big ones. Um, we didn't really talk about prison reformists in the one before, so I felt this was important to highlight. In colonial America, punishments were incredibly severe. Um, in Massachusetts, if you were caught as a thief three times, no matter the reasoning, no matter what you stole, you were hanged. So, essentially, if Caitlin stole a car three times, she was hanged. If I stole if I, bread. Yes, if I stole three pieces of gum on three separate occasions, I was also hanged. Um, so, technically punishments were equal, but they weren't equitable. Um, and implementation was haphazardous at best. There was a, essentially no effective policing systems. And if a judge was like, oh, that seems like the punishment's excessive, they weren't going to convict. Um, basically because there wasn't what we have now is judges can say, okay, I'm convicting you of grand theft 
auto, but, you know, you stole the car because your grandmother was passed out and you had to get her to the hospital, you know, whatever, they can have some leeway in, like, you're not going to jail for the rest of your life. Back then, they didn't. It was like, oh, you stole your third time, you're hanged. So they often wouldn't, they just wouldn't convict you. They'd be like, oh, loaves of bread? No, not guilty. Which, like, is not a good policing system by any wow. means. Um, also, jail was not really a punishment by any means. It wasn't, like, you weren't sentenced to jail time. The only people really sitting in jail were those awaiting a trial. Um, and those who were in debt. If you were in debt, you went to jail. Which makes no sense, because then you're not even working. You're just sitting there, waiting. How's the debt getting paid off then? But so essentially, it was men awaiting trial, those in debt, and also um, people with severe mental illnesses who were hard to control. Um, there were really two options. You were either placed in, you know, an asylum or a sanatorium if it was available to you or a local jail. Um, which is really just terrible to think that, you know, your local jail is not treating the illness. And that's really what it is. It's not like they're a bad person. It's they have an illness that needs treated. Um, so in the aftermath of independence, most states did amend their crim criminal punishment statutes. Um, we weren't all ruled under one governing body. We can make our own. So Pennsylvania eliminated the death penalty for robbery and burglary in 1786 and in 1794 eliminated it for everything but first degree murder. Um, Truth was a strong advocate of prison reform as many were back then. They believed um, in lighter punishments, I guess. Not lighter punishments, but more variety in punishments. So it shouldn't immediately be um, nothing or hanged. Three days in jail or you're hanged. Um, they also advocated for a more equitable trial process. Um, they advocated that the trial process applied to everyone because until the 14th Amendment, it was thought that not everyone was eligible for a trial by due process. Um, so there were a lot of things in the reform movement. Truth's biggest thing was being very outspoken against the use of capital punishment, um, which is the death penalty, which is still used in some states today, um, not in all, and it's no longer used federally, but... Um, she advocated very early on for the removal and um, essentially staged it as being, you know, you come from a life where you're not sure, will my master kill me? Will they abuse me? So you are fighting to fix a system that you see very near to your experience. So these freed slaves are looking at prison thinking, oh my gosh, that's exactly how I felt. Like, how is this going to shake out? What's going to happen to me? And um, constant abuse. And so they're outspoken against these kind of systems. So it is important to note, and it is interesting to note, that um, prison reform is still being discussed today. So back then, there were no private prisons. Now there are. Um, there are differences, but there are still Issue. similar things. They want to see them be more... Um, rehabilitative and less retributive so it's not just punishment but also what can we do to not make you go out and do this again so if it's a mental illness how can we treat it if it's I didn't have money so I just steal bread to feed my family how can we teach you a trader skill so that you can enter the job force um, so that was prison reform back then prison reform now obviously looks a little different um, things have changed a little bit, but it is interesting just to note that she was so, I don't want to say spread thin, just... She was busy. Yeah, she was busy. She was a busy lady. She had a lot of passions. 
And the one that brings her to our talk show is a suffragette. So in 1851, Truth delivered her anti-woman speech in Akron, Ohio at the Women's Rights Convention. Um, Because she obviously couldn't read or write, her speech was very impromptu. She spoke from the heart. And while there is no exact script of what her speech entailed, there are three main versions I was able to come across. And those are the three main versions that are typically referenced whenever they talk about her. Um, No matter what, her speech made a lasting effect on the people at the convention. And I would strongly recommend to our listeners that if you have an opportunity to listen to somebody, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, like present her speech, especially Mm -hmm. in the native, like, Dutch. Because there are people that did that research and did it in a, with a Dutch accent to do it as similarly as to how she probably conveyed it. And I think it was, it was very moving in my opinion, all three versions. Um, so I would really recommend to listen to it because it really puts into perspective where she was at emotionally and how she felt about the way women, especially her being a black woman being treated. And I think it's really interesting now that we are starting to talk more about her and not just about the main upper class white women that were the original people that was always associated with the coming of the uh, 19th Amendment. And we were actually talking about this right before the podcast started. The U.S. Treasury announced that Truth will be featured on the new $10 bill along with the other suffragettes, finally. It was said to come out this year for the 100th anniversary of the amendment. However, Corona. Corona ruined so- you guys are stuck with this podcast instead yeah, I was say. we do hope to see it come out eventually um i do also think it's important to note she worked with a lot of big name suffragettes so she worked with anthony she worked with katie Sin, and she actually did um bruise some shoulders in that you know there was this idea that katie Sin had you know, I guess now we'd refer to it as a domineering personality, but she was very, oh, you won't give black women the right to vote? Well, then you shouldn't give black men the right to vote. And Truth argued against this and said, at least if black men have the right to vote, black voices can be heard. Like, you're not worried about it because your husband's voting. Yeah. Like, is your voice heard? No, but your voice has an impact on your husband. Anyone has an impact on their significant other. When we keep the moral compass of the household, it keeps coming back around in conversation. I do think it was, like, just important to note she did work with them, and there was a lot of tension because, as we've said, the movement wasn't inclusive. And even some of the more inclusive members had issues and would align themselves with non-inclusive members. And it's like, well, you were doing great, but then you went and did that. And it's like, for what? For why? Who said that was a good idea? But she fought heavily not only for the right, right of Black women to vote, but for the right of all women to vote. And I just think that's really important because sometimes, even today, white women have the tendency to only fight for white women. And that isn't okay. Feminism should be inclusive of all women, of men, of anyone who thinks equality should be the norm. Yep. And Truth fought for that very early on. Yeah. So now that we've had this little rant, (laughs) I think we should get into our discussion questions. Yeah, number one. So during her speech, she cited that men need not to be afraid that giving women's rights would cause us to fight to essentially hold all the power. She used it as a sense of um, if we have a pint and they have a quart, there's no reason why they can't help us fill up our pint. You know, we're not going to ask for it to be overflowed. We just want what we deserve and what we should have. Um, do we think that this is a still a common concern by anti-feminists? Do you want me to start? Because I have feelings. 
I think my issue is I have many conflicting feelings about this. So you can start, and I'll get mine in order. <laughs> so I do think this is a big issue, is that even, I think it's not a issue that people think of actively. I think it's a sub a subdued inner idea that we don't think about consciously. It's a subconscious thought that if we start giving people, and this goes not just for women, but anybody equal rights, well, then why don't, you know, people get defensive because people want to see people like them in roles of power and in roles of social change in the norm. And when they don't see that, they get defensive. They don't see it as, oh, that's a person. You know, they have to associate it with how it affects them and how it connects to them. So I think deep down, that is a big concern, is that if we give women the right to have more power in society, be more influential, it somehow takes away from you. That's my thought. A short answer to the question, yes, I think this is a common concern by anti-feminists, and I think this is a common argument used by anti-feminists. My biggest issue with this argument, and even with the example you used of the court and the pint, it isn't yours. It isn't a pie. Like, equality isn't a pie. I can vote, and Caitlin can vote, and Dante can vote, and Tree can vote, and Sarah can vote. Like, we can all vote. If I had a birthday cake, and it was cut into five slices, only five of my friends, well, technically only four of my friends, because I'm also getting a slice of birthday cake, can have birthday cake. It's not a birthday cake. Like, it is essentially one of the only limitless things, this idea of power. And so again, even this idea of a seat at the table, it isn't your table. It isn't your power to give me some of. Like, I think that's my biggest issue with it, that this women are going to take men's power. Men don't have power. It's not your power. Like, it doesn't belong to anyone. And I think that's what I find so frustrating. And, like, why my thoughts were just immediately, like, this is gross and despicable. It isn't a pie. It isn't a court container. It isn't a birthday cake. Like, we can all vote. We can all be represented in our chambers of government. We can all be represented on the Supreme Court. Like, this idea that, you know, it has to be split. Like, it's something that there's not enough of. Or it's like something. Yeah. yeah. Like, you're not losing rights because I get rights. It's, it's not a pie. If you have the right to vote and I'm asking for the right to vote, they don't have to take your right to vote away to give it to me. They just say, okay, now you both have the right to vote. And I think that's the reason why they think that there's something being taken away from them because they, people want to see people like them in their reflection. Instead of, but people don't look past the physical or the socio, the societal even. They don't look past that and look at the person and see how are we connected? How do we, how do we work as, as, sa- as uh, same people, I want to say. So, like, just because, like, say you come up to somebody, you're a Republican and they're a Democrat, and you have very contrasting views. Just because they have rights and you have rights doesn't mean that takes away from your rights. How you should see it is you're both Americans. You're both in the same place. You're both in the same time period. You're both dealing, you're both facing the same issues, whether you agree with them or not, to see them differently. That's what the thing, that's the issue I think it is, is that people want to see people like them because they want to be agreed with. And if you're not going to be with someone you agree with and you can't see past that agreeing with somebody and sharing a connection with them are two different things. Yeah, it just makes it really hard for them to not see it as a pie. Yeah, but I do think it is a common concern. Um, sorry, that didn't really answer the question. That was just a rant that I have. You about. said first thought. Yes, <laughs> it is still still a concern. Um, I think it's unfounded, and I also think people will say, you know, speaking of 
seeing people the same. People will say, you know, representation isn't that important. It doesn't matter if when you look at your favorite TV show or a magazine or the Supreme Court, if you don't see someone who looks like you. And I think that is incredibly untrue. I think it's very nearsighted. It's very nearsighted and it's very easy to say when everyone around you looks like you. Absolutely. When you can look at a TV show and you can look at a magazine, you can look at a body of government and you can say, hey, there is a blonde, blue-eyed chick just like me, which is a privilege I have. I'm not, I have a privilege in that when I look at bodies of government and TV shows and I can usually identify with a character. Not everyone can do that. And so that is important. Like representation is important. And anyone who tries to tell you it's not important, you know they're lying because they'll immediately get mad and be like, well, it detracts from another character that could be there. Yeah, what you're trying to say is it detracts from a white character that could be there. White, straight male. Ah. Like, <laughs> like, what is it, that Harry Potter meme where the brother's, like, crying and he goes, 36? But last year I had 37. We'll go what is it, birth four birth and we'll get one more. Yeah, like, like that's what I think of. Yeah, that, was Dudley. that was Dudley also. Fun fact. Dudley. I couldn't think of his name, but I could, like, picture him and the dad and him being like, how many? And his dad's like, 36. Yeah. <laughs> like, I couldn't imagine. You would, your hands would get tired. <laughs> Okay, discussion question number two. Given the light of the situation in our country, how do you think she would have reacted given her abolitionist and anti-violence views? I'm going to say I actually struggle to see her out at the protests. Yeah. I think she would be more of like a Capitol Hill person than like a out in protest person, if that makes sense. I agree. Because she doesn't like violence, and the potential for violence there, I think, would put her off. And I think she would just see, like, reading about her, I got the sense that she knew where she was best served. Yes, I agree. And so she would know that she isn't best served on the protest line. She would be best served in Capitol Hill, calling senators, meeting with leaders and executives. and So I think she would be involved. I think she would immediately denounce it. I struggle to see her, like, out there holding a sign. I think she would be much background, like, in the background doing stuff. I think so, too. Yeah, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth. That's how I felt. Is that I, I felt that just because there was that potential for violence there, and she was so, despite her lack of, like, literacy, she was well-versed, and she was well-spoken in her own way. And I think that's, she, like you said, she knew, she knew how to use her gifts, and I think that's what she would have done. So the last question, because we brought up prison reform, how do you think truth would react to the modern day prison industrial complex? Bad. I think she would be very disheartened by it because of the amount of, just like how you spoke about how prison, she did not like prison for the simple fact that how much it reminded her of her own personal prison that she had to live with until she was emancipated. And I think that there are a lot of crimes that people are imprisoned for that they should not be imprisoned for because they are not violent acts or acts that are extreme enough to warrant. I just don't know how that helps anybody. I don't know how it helps the people that pay for, you know, like the taxpayers. I don't think it helps with that. I don't think it helps with the people that are needing to quote unquote, like learn from whatever it is they did I just think she would be upset about it, especially because of the amount of violence, again, that happens in those situations, too. I think she would be absolutely appalled by the idea of privatized prisons, where a company buys a prison and then a government leases them prisoners. 
Um, I think that idea would disgust her because, again, you're then treating human like chattel yeah. and not human beings. Um, I also think, I kind of agree with you, I think she would have an issue with the disparaging sentences. So, you know, you could murder someone and go to jail for six months. You could also get caught with marijuana and go to jail for six months. Yeah. So, rape somebody and go to jail for three months. I'll die mad about that. 1,000% I'll die mad about that because there's people in the news every day who don't go to jail. And there's people, there are people, minorities, who are blasted on social media saying this person raped someone, therefore this minority is full of bad people. Yep. I'm like, no. Like, no, that's not how it works. But um, yeah. just similar... She would see similarities to really colonial American prisons in that prison sentences are, you know, poor enforcement, poor policing, um, not necessarily street policing, poor policing of courts. And like we talked about earlier, it was major. It's majority lower income. You know, we aren't giving people like police enforcements are typically in lower. Um, poverty areas, more poverty areas, I mean. And so that increases the number of people that are getting caught with crimes because that's where they're being checked. I'll never forget, I was in, it was my second year at school, I was in, I think it was like public policy and administration, maybe? Not sure. It was, it was a criminal justice related course. Um, and we learned that crack has harsher punishments on it than cocaine. And if you don't know, crack is the same chemically as cocaine. Cocaine is just refined crack. And sometimes crack can be cut with things. But the idea was cocaine is a rich man's drug. Cocaine is the drug of Wall Street. Crack is the drug of the slums. You're not buying cocaine in the ghettos, and you're not buying crack on Wall Street. And so they're policed differently, which is so wild to me, because it's the same thing. You're doing the same thing. And here is what I will always say. If you're saying it affects a ghetto or a slum or a poverty area more, you're saying it affects a minority more. Like, you're trying to say it without saying it affects minorities more. because they are minority majority areas. It's just, you know, if you were saying rural Western Pennsylvania, I'd say just say white. Yeah. Like, for real, just say white. That's what you're trying to say. <laughs> like, so I think she would be appalled. Um, and I think she would continue to advocate for change. And there are a lot of people advocating for change. Um, she would be paying attention to the ballots, making sure she is voting in people and who just feel similar to her. Also, like, I don't think she'd care as much about who is you're voting for than the fact that you're using your voice to vote. I think she'd care more about that. Yeah, she would want to see you voting for who you believe in, even if you, who you believe in isn't who she believes in. As long as you're saying, I believe in this. At least you believe in something. Like, so she would make sure she's registered to vote at vote411.org. <laughs> um, or votes PA if you're from Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, and, I mean, that's really the first step to any change is the ballot box. Absolutely. Coming here in November, I believe there are a couple states voting tomorrow. Um, tomorrow being the 7th. So voting yesterday when you hear this. But um, New Jersey and Delaware, I believe. So make sure on that note, you guys go out and vote because Sojourner Truth would want you to. She would. She would be disappointed if you didn't. Because she never got to. She tried really hard. All right. Well, I think that was a really good episode. I think, well, I know I learned a lot about her and I'm hoping that we can you know, follow in her footsteps and start doing some good work. 
Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you for tuning in for another episode. And who are we talking about next week? Unclear. Let me check real quick. It is Gertrude Bustill Mosel. Probably said that wrong. I don't know who that is. It's a lot of letters. I don't know who that is. Well, we have a whole week to research her. In two weeks, so the week following Gertrude Bustill Mosel, that's the pronunciation I'm going with. Sorry, guys. It'll be right for the episode. We will be talking about. Shirley Kism, and we will have our good friend Tree on. Yay! I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I haven't yeah. seen Tree in forever. <laughs> so make sure you guys turn into these next couple of episodes because they're going to be doozies. All right, thanks guys, and make sure you come and see us next week. This has been Wednesday's Women, sponsored by the Clarion University CU Engaged Coalition. The thoughts and ideas presented in this podcast are meant to be for entertainment purposes first and foremost, and we do not claim to be experts in any field. As always, thanks for listening, and make sure you go out and register to vote.